All right, time to do more cleanup. Uh, first, uh, let me give an example of the kind of secondary missions that you could do in the game, but I trimmed for the most part because a lot of them were not really that important to see. For example, um, you can have missions where you actually free human slaves from, you know, from the orcs. Uh, and they usually are the same kind of variant, like rescue the slaves and defeat the orcs nearby. But again, I, I kept the last because, you know, it's, it's the one that's a bit more, you know, not colorful, but, you know, important uh, compared to the others um and again just to give an example on uh, what they are like uh, the good news about this is that you feel a call from some of the previous now. parts um when you actually free the human slave you can put have a percentage of potentially causing an uprising as the secondary objective tells as in the slaves instead of choice. just running away will actually fight for you and as a result also call you know, back up for that, giving you a bit of an edge, because remember, the orcs operate on, uh, you know, quantity over quality, but, uh, you know, if also the slaves are fighting also for you, um, that is a bit nullified. Mm -hmm. And yes, you, as you can see, you even have one of the special finisher, you know, um, type of move that instantly brands up mm. one Uruk if, you're, if you need to, to pick up elven shots or you need an extra ally immediately to balance out a bit. So again, the game gives you a bit of a couple of tools in order to, you know, uh, give you potentially the edge in deciding the, the title of the battle. And again, in this particular mission, thanks to Vego, this I managed to cause the, uh, the uprising. A lot of humans actually have come to, to actually, you know, distract the orcs while I get to free the others. Cool thing is that you can see also the NPCs can also, you know, free other, you know, trap companions. So again, this mission is super easy when you really get down to it. Mm. Thank goodness. Right. And then that slave dies. No, don't worry. There we go. Gondor is with us. Now it is time to rise up, men. Oh, uh, Look, I know we're tethered to a ghost, but I don't think that makes us a ghost ourselves. No. Also, three type of missions that you can get are a set of missions that help forging the legend of your of your weapons, as in legend being forged by by uh, you know making particular action with them. In this case, for example. This is, uh, we have stealth missions in order to forge the legend of, uh, you know, Talion's Dagger. I forgot the precise name, but it will mention it at the end. Um, Talion's Dagger, combat missions for, you know, for the sword, and shooting galleries essentially for the bow, for an arrow. Uh -huh. Again, it, it also helps, it kind of gives the idea of, uh, helps the mystic with the idea that, yes, you know, the legends will be forged eventually, but there will be, you know, a basis for it, as in, uh, even the text of a mission is flavored like it's telling a story. For example, in this case, he's, uh, you know, he's leaked in the fortress without, you know, even being noticed as a, like a ghost between them, you know, and made a, you know, uh, and made a, committed a lot of murder, you know. Mm -hmm. Yoink. This is actually one of the more difficult ones because, again, you need, you're supposed to actually manage to kill specific targets, which are always in groups, so you need to also take care of the others without having to raise the alarms. Now, the good thing is that the alarms, if we, I forgot if I told specific, but uh, um, the alarms does not get raised immediately because uh, uh, if you get spotted, because at that point, one orc will, be, will decide potentially to go and raise the alarm, which essentially has to go to, from point A to point B and, and actually, you know, push basically a button, kind of like. And the game even highlights with uh, with an icon, if that happens. So you have even the option potentially to, you know, let that happen, if you're, you know, you're willing to fight the reinforcement or anything, or if you're not supposed to, you know, trigger the alarm, like in this case, you have to prioritize your target at that point. Also, that icon showcases the fact that one of the captains that I have branded is actually, you know, nearby. So that, you know, even if uh, I get you know, get to fight, uh, that one can can be at least a distraction.
creature. What do you think they're up to? Nothing good, that's for damn sure. Just gotta put both of them down. Then they move in the dark your energy for killing. Alright, number four. Only one remaining. Alright guys, let's uh, let's head off. Let's uh, head off. <laughs> uh, also, mm -hmm. if you forgot the, the the dagger in question, which also we're forging the legend of, is actually uh, the broken sword of Talion's son. Which he actually kept also as a memento. But it works well. So, let's do this. Ah, Karna. There we go. A dagger secret in the night, terrifying evil doers who must give back with blood. Swallows pain and rest, and rest becomes black. But when you actually complete these missions, you know, um, the. Um, Calibrimbor reforges your weapon to make them look more elvish. Also, as a result, it doesn't really change anything aside from you know aesthetic. And probably by the time of the next game, they revert for some reason to their default appearance. <coughs> oh, oops, you know. Um, but it's still cool. Alright, now let's get to the bow and arrow class challenge, which I left uh, here. Again, this is another one of those missions where you're confined in a small area, like in this, uh, yeah, this upper one, and you're supposed to kill a bunch of targets uh, while being confined there. Again, this is really, really easy when you get down to it. Mm -hmm. Especially because, again, you, you're you not confined by, you know, raising the alarm or anything, so you're just free to do as you please. Mm. The important part also is that, remember, your focus is what causes the slow-mo, so once that gets, uh, you know, properly depleted, you have to wait, you know, until it... Uh, if the gauge gets full again, or uh, you have to risk of you know not using the slow motion again. I heard his spear hit it so hard it punched a hole clean through its chest. See if I can gain a bit of an advantage from here. Yes, sir. I don't. Th I don't remember if I had auto aim, uh, you know, turned on or off, uh, forgot. Uh, but I can say that, you know, for aiming controls with a con uh, console game, they actually work out fine. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you're not supposed to see me here. There you go. <laughs> Pay no attention to the man walking on the top. <laughs> Also, I have no idea why every time you actually, you know, shoot an arrow, Troy Baker sounds like he's taking a massive dump. <laughs> Immersive, supposedly. I get the idea he's supposed to, like, release the tension, I suppose, of, you know, the, the shooting maneuver, but I don't know, it sounds a bit goofy. There we go. Narvi. Oh, is that... Ah, sorry, Ascar. These arrows truly may, they hit their mark. There we go. 
the arrow, the bow and arrow oh. was always part of Celebrimbor, but it looks like a compound bow for some reason. Um, well done, you have completed the you have completed the legend of a metal stick with a string on it. A journey complete. Its strength is at the Sometimes it's a simple thing, Dweebs. You'd be amazed the backstory you can get from such simple items. And last, and last the story. There's a backstory. I got sick because he was bored at the end. <laughs> Remember, that's one of the key components of the hobby. The Bilbo literally forges forges the legend of his own blade, you know, <coughs> um, by accident, despite the fact that he also got it by accident. So there is that. Okay, that is pretty cool, actually. Mm -hmm. The um, the fireplace you kill. You can detonate the ball fires again. They can give an advantage. They do not kill enemies with shields, but enemies nearby, aside from Captain, can potentially be insta killed by that. So yeah, for this one it's actually more simple to go out, because you can clear the, the specific areas from the from the guards. You can also detonate the, the barrels of Grog, you know, for creating a, sim a similar effect. That's a shark. I mean, after all, this is a, a Hamlet part of, uh, of Nurnen, so I guess there's that. I thought you were going to jump in the lake. No. The game doesn't really allow you to, to jump off, to, you know, uh, off borders into bottomless pizza. Because, you know, if, you're, if you don't have any way to connect to, us, to another, you know, surface or a place where you can jump onto, uh, the game will not simply allow you to do it. The control will not respond to the input that you press. So. Yeah, one does not simply walk off a cliff. <laughs> In Mordor. Well, not really sneaking, but sure. If I recall correctly, one of the skills also allows you, if you if you're good enough with the timing, to actually, you know. And have perfect counters, uh, which allows you know to potentially insta kill the basic Kuruks, uh, you know, if you're good, very good with the timing. But I forgot if it's actually one of the upgrades that you get, or one of the rooms that you can you know put into the weapons. Yeah, I don't think I mentioned that much of that either, because it will not be important even for the for training. But one other thing that you do in terms of upgrading your character is that each weapon have a starting three rules lock each, which can you know upgrade to a maximum of five each. Um, in which you put rules which allow particular perks. Uh, like if in depending on if you kill captains you get rules so depending the fact of which depends on the high power level of the captain. So the higher the power level the the, the more prestigious and thus more effective the rune is. You can even get stuff that is considered epic quote unquote. You know? But as uh, probably the most useful effect, like for example, making Talion completely immune to poison attacks, uh, you know, with, because some enemies can potentially have that, uh, you know. Um, so again, it's always also a good idea to to invest uh, in deciding what to do with captains, making maybe raising one by letting be being killed or killing their rivals, uh, you know, more time. There you go, Urfael. A beacon of light to the unled, unled, blazing like fire with justice in land stained with foulness. One stands alone in the light. Um, there we go. A bit more stylish, I guess, but not too different from the previous one. Nice rendering. It's a shame you can't equip these weapons. Well, they're always by default, uh, so... Again, the second game will be the ones that actually instead applies a more of a traditional, you know, different weapons and armors that time can switch between. Mm -hmm. Now time for the artifacts of this region. So let's get them. Here we go. Starting with an Azurai figurine. The two of the two is studied. This crudely carved figurine depicts two enigmatic wizards who came to Mordor hunting a great evil. 
Although their pair likely never escaped the Cursed Realm, their exploits were well detailed and may have inspired the creation of magical cults from Middle Earth. We forgot the history of the Wizard Order to which Saruman, uh, you know, Gandalf and Radagast are part of. These two actually went to the East ideally in order to try to, to you know, impart their wisdom there, but unfortunately, it's so strongly implied they did not succeed. As well. Funnily enough, those two look like a younger. Well, a, a potentially younger Gandalf and Saruman. I can assure you they're two different complete people, but it would make sense considering the Istaris are supposed to be servants of the demigods who were just, you know, sent to uh, Middle-earth as guiding figures in the end. Again, the, the appearance of old men with magical powers was deliberate in order to be inspiring uh, to, other, to all the races. Uh. Mm -hmm. This particular dialogue is associated to there you go to to a couple of people who met the the history and uh, and just recounted the their you know how they interacted with them. Mm -hmm. I laughed at dear Hyle when he talked of wizards, necromancers, and magic. I told him to stop being a child. As children, you are closest to the Eldar. When grown, you have no understanding of immortality. The irony. To the enemy! Okay. Go away. <laughs> All right, next one. If he comes back, I'll kill him then. An orcish dagger. Dagger may be a generous application of the word. This is a crude shank, and it will never be used for anything but skull daggery. Uruks generally carry blades of this ilk when engaging in their misdeeds, and the blades are often coated with crude poisons to ensure the victim a victim's painful death. Uruks will often carry daggers like this one into combat, but only employ them as last resort. Let's get the memory board. You've been recalled? Aye, it was Gilead. Burning the bodies there. Is that bad? It's worse. We've abandoned Duathan. Either to the orcs or the outcasts. I can't imagine which is worse. And we're thin on the ground here. Two regiments worth called back home. Maybe a dozen more down with the sweats. Maybe even more than that. And I don't think we can hide it anymore. No matter how they change up the patrols. The orcs may have already smelled it out too. They're getting uppity and more. Here. That's quite a blade. Where'd you get it? Off an orc scout. Off your mom. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure it's much of a trophy to, to keep, to be honest, but uh, sure. You know, an artifact is an artifact. It's the spirit of Mordor, the knife in the back. They do our work for us. Huh. United in their hatred of man and dominated by the will of their master. Alright, next one. A frowning skull. For a thousand years, this skull has been a sacred relic of the most feared orc assassin called within Mordor, the Dev said. They hold it as a symbol of their glorious future, free of a scourge of man. We'll actually see how assassins or assassins orc operate in the next game, trust me. Should be interesting. Please, my wife. Yes, you would have told me to go on about her. Tell us what we need to know. Where are the bandits? Where are your friends? I need to see her. I need. Yes, your wife. Again. It has been a long time. And while the physical pain of your torture will. Over a distant memory, a phantom. 
All for naught. Mm -hmm. And again, this show showcases how orcs who are smarter than others, you know, are even more dangerous uh, because of their conniving. Uh, Haunting in that skull. Alas, poor Yorick, I suppose. Mm -hmm. I knew him, Horatio. Those who gave in to despair, who abandoned all hope of redemption. That is not our fate. Fair enough. Well, Next good to one. see you're optimistic. More determined to a pipe with pouch. The precious metal pipe with emanates from this oversized pouch. The owner of this pouch harvested both the leaves and the flowers of pipe with plant in equal measure. The leaves are commonly dried and smoked in pies, and the flowers chewed to create a potent narcotic. As for the pouch itself, it appears to have come from the poison sack of Arungol, as in a spider. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, continuing the, the themes of, uh, you know, the pipe weed being not even just tobacco, pro probably marijuana. And hey, it's starving this time around for the memory. For the oh, <laughs> yeah, for a second I thought that was the Final Fantasy VII logo. Really, really rusty. Actually, it looks, uh, seen from behind like this, it looks more like of a, a piece of ham. Mm. Whereas uh, the narrator from King's Quest V would say a savory leg of lamb. Yeah, that too. It's a gift, really. A tournament. This was your first kill. Ours together is what made you a hunter. Some of these item descriptions you can see with the memories also help us flesh a bit more the, what Torbin told us about uh, him and his brother. Hmm. What they were doing before he got killed. I could puffing on that pipe weed once. He raided the garrison pantry and consumed a week's worth of field rations. Human minds and appetites are a mystery to my people. <laughs> it's funny because I'm a ghost and I don't eat. Mm -hmm. And even mm. he has standards. I mean, that's enough of medallion. We'll get the others soon enough. The elves of Eregion crafted wonderful medallions, uh, tokens they carry into battle for inspiration to remind themselves of their history. This particular artifact, representing the fabled Two Trees of Valinor, appears to have been split by a particular wicked blade wielded by a powerful foe. Its missing half may have been carried off to distant lands. Because I actually don't know, um, the Trees of Valinor are rooted into the um, the legend of the Silmarillion, you know. The idea behind it is before everything else where, you know, all the uh, the demigods, could, you know, existed around the same place, roughly. Um, these two trees produced fruits which were comparable to jewels which emanated, you know, radiant light. When uh, Melkor, a.k.a. Morgoth, decided to, you know, rise of power, he decided to steal or destroy most of them, and the two that uh, were that got saved by the, as a result of that uh, became the sun and the moon, as a result. Again, the Silmarillion is essentially this big epic that's comparable to, say, the, Bi the Bible or classic Norse mythology, potentially, in how it shapes literally the land. In victory or defeat, my people will diminish. Optimistic. Well, more more realist. Remember, the third <clears throat> age is where the elves are in, in steep decline. Yeah, it don't matter, we're it's dying anyway. Yeah. Across Mordor, the two trees of vine are recognized as a symbol of the light of creation and of the ancient bond between elves and men. This medallion half crafted by the elves commemorates the original two trees of legends, whose signs now survive only in the white tree of Gondor. Fascinating. All right. Hold still. I'm afraid to say it's going to. It's going to hurt. I've done all I can. Yeah, this out of context. Uh, yeah. Yuri Lowenthal screaming like that. Yes. Yeah, so. Oh boy. <laughs> It's like uh, it's like hearing out of context the death screams uh, from some games like Halo or the first Dark Souls, uh, where it sounds more like the voice actors are moaning. <laughs> yeah. The endless cycle, life, death, river. Come closer, and I will tell you their tale. We must. I feel we must 
distract ourselves from the grim happenings of this. That is true. Let's let's of... less bonk each other. Well, again, more like telling stories. I mean, again, it's it's a real thing that uh, you know happens we'll during any war. Well, that's, that's one way of distracting each other. Let those who come after take the glory. And, and, yeah, yeah, no, that's... Lord of the Rings is one of the most homoerotic series I've ever seen. <laughs> you haven't clearly read the Jojo yet. Uh, all right, mm. next. Uh, an ornate cameo. This piece may have been commissioned by men and crafted by the dwarves. It is known the races traded freely between each other and in turn with the elves. Mm. Many fine wares would find their way into Mordor via trade facilitated by the Sea of Nurnen. Such trade routes have closed, possibly with finality, with the return of the Uruks. Huh. Interesting stuff. Oops. Oops. You mean you won this at the tavern? My husband. Get in the house. <laughs> <laughs> what a lovely family. <laughs> the rivers of this sea reach beyond the Ethel Duoth. If the tribesmen can escape, they could travel north to Minas Ethel, the Tower of the Moon. It will actually see what happens to that in the next <coughs> game. Trust me. Yeah, there's a good chance it's not Minas Tirith, because the uh, ruler it's... there is, uh... Well, it will be yeah. a more safe place, technically. A crushed spider egg. This Ungor egg has clearly been kept as a memento, but for what reason? Does it represent yet another casualty in the burgeoning war in, war in Mordor, the one being fought between the forces of Sauron and the children of Queen Shelob? Or is this just a remnant of some Uruk's supper? Hmm... Maybe tell... I think the memory will tell us something more. I speak with the mouth of Sauron, the second dark lord of this middle earth. Our will is his will. Mordor is ours, and fairly one. You will take this message from Sauron back to your spider queen Shelob, the last daughter of Un. Children will no longer prey on the Morgul flies. You will depart this realm, abandon your nests in non Ungo. You have grown fat on the It seems that unfortunately, again, Mordor and Shelob are not exactly on speaking terms, uh, which is reflected also by the time of, re of the movie version of Return of the King, uh, where Shelob operates alone without, you know, progeny, you know, and in secrecy. The orcs are aware of her presence, uh, but simply put, do not have enough, you know, resources or, you know, caring in order to go after her. Uh -uh. Every creature here seems to live to slaughter every other. And every one of them will learn to fear us above all. Yes, they will learn to. Le they will learn to fear a man who's constantly hunched over and his ghost friend. <laughs> a coded journal. This parchment contains a note, but its author and intended rest recipient remain ultimately unre unrevealed. It is a dispatch of some kind, a recounting of great deeds, poetry. The note is coded, and its message remains indecipherable. To remember from previous regions, Saruman apparently had a spy, uh, a couple of spies roaming around the place, so maybe it's one of those. Uh... Okay, I'll admit, if these are Americans, um, they do okay British accents. Probably instructed to do to pre precise to to do precisely this. Again, it it helps with again the orcs are supposed to be very over the top with uh, with our accent. Uh. <laughs> Why can't we have some meat? Sweet. <laughs> 
Um, because we do, so if, uh, if we ever get to commentate on stuff like the the Warhammer Forty K games, I can assure you, in a couple of most of those games, there are Canadians who have to do, you know, British accent for the orcs over there. Like uh, I forgot the name, um, Canadian Vegeta, as a voice actor, I forgot. Um, the war that is coming to engulf all Middle no, Earth. Brian, 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 Brian Drummond. Drummond. Yeah, um, place. Whatever. That that guy also is particular among voicing that was roles. Uh, trust me. But uh, next one, an apothecary jar. These jar ones. Brian Drummond. Okay. These jar ones held the elixir which sustains and corrupts the Queen of Shore. When Marwen awoke, screaming from nightmares, showing her the Tower of Sauron approaching Nurn, she saw wisdom. She traveled to the Grey Mountain, seeking answer. When she returned, she brought the elixir with her, and under the, its influence she spent many hours staring into the sacred flame. In it, she heard a calming voice and found hope for her people, if not for herself. But as we know, it was merely a trick from Sauron. Yeah, I'm surprised there hasn't been any um, what if Middle Earth stories. For the time being, not really, you know, because we're more content to, even if we want to do alterations to the to the to the canon, yeah. still doing relatively more contained capacity. Um, I can tell you that <coughs> the second game ends with finality <coughs> and you know aligns itself with the canon of the movies at the very least, you know, just taking its own spin. But uh, yeah. still ends already up is, is slowly open, but uh, as showcased by the fact we're making a Wonder Woman game, I get the idea the that Warner Bros. and Monley prefers to do something else after this. Uh, like, um, like well, there's all sorts you could do, like, uh, oh. there's all sorts you could do. There's, um, what if, um, what if Gandalf the rig to Mordor, or, um, anyway. or what if, um, Sauron was a dude, what if Sauron was a pussy? Or what if Saruman never turned evil? Anyway, this sigil has been as cinema choose originally to serve as an important ceremonial function preparing ritual feast. However, since the invasion of Normandy, Urox has been used as a weapon, basically. So the typical soldier weapon. Well, not really. Remember, it was again. This was a ceremonial weapon. That instead has to be now used as a proper weapon because uh, the scarcity of resources for the people involved. Well, that's what I mean. It went from being ceremonial to becoming a typical weapon, it seems. Okay. That would be quite the interesting side to see Christopher Lee playing a nice Saruman. Didn't we get that in The Hobbit? Oh wait, that's right. You weren't around for those. It requires explanation. Um. For the book, yes, but the movie tries to play a bit fast and loose and say that at that point Saruman was already partially corrupted. It so, could have fooled me. He's actually pretty nice and upbeat in the Hobbit films. Well, it's it's more noticed. Well, again, it's noticed because during the meeting of the White Council, he wants to dismiss the whole thing, not believing you know Sauron has returned properly. And by the end, by the beginning of the third movie, where they defeat the Necromancer. He just says, leave him to me without sinister green on his face. Anyway, this is a whetstone. Among the millions of volcanic rocks to be found within the mountainous mountain border of Mordor, this stone is unique. It's a dwarven whetstone used to sharpen axes, knives, and swords to a keen edge that will cut through even the toughest Uruk armor with stony skin of a troll. It's the keen edge that cuts the mountain, as the saying goes. Whoever hmm. the stone's user was, he was most far out in his efforts. All right, then. Is that his fat? 
Tish pulling warp dwarf hair. No, he literally just said, you know, to test the sharpness, so you're supposed, supposed to split the hair in two. Very handy in that regard. I don't know if he's brave or stupid. Or both. He has no fear of death. But there are many worse things than death waiting in Mordor. A broken staff. Some great forms <coughs> like this wizard staff asunder. Fashioned from a sapling, this gnarled staff served as a walking stick, a magical rod, and a weapon for wandering wizard. What became of its owner and how it was broken is a mystery. It strongly implies it's from one of the two studies, but again, kept vague on purpose. Asterix and Obelix. <laughs> oh my god, that would be a crossover now. Asterix and Obelix. On the journey of the Lord of the Rings. Stories are potentially a bit too dark for them. Maybe it would work better for The Hobbit because, again, the movies may have given a bit of a bad, more bad impression, but The Hobbit, most throughout, is supposed to be a relatively more lighthearted kind of story. Mm -hmm. Sure, it still has its moments of tension and everything, but overall it's more pleasant than the the, the severe, dire, straight uh, state of the world is in uh, by the time of Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. These wizards, the Istari, what do you know of them? Is their power greater than yours? I have not yet been tested against them. Saruman the White is the leader of the White Council. His knowledge of the Rings of Power is deep. A Gondorian coin. Merchants across Middle-earth know if it's Gondorian, it's good. And they freely accept the silver pieces, known as Castar, as currency, trading them across the civilized realms and with almost all the races of Middle-earth. This particular coin likely made its way into Mordor throughout the realm's primary trade route, the Sea of Nornen. If you, if you watch old pieces of media, like say the, the Disney Pinocchio, um, and you're confused by people making sure that a coin is authentic by fighting it, it's because a lot of counterfeit would use uh, a more malleable metal like copper and just paint it over. So in order to make sure that the coin was actually proper, you know, merchants and all the such will actually bite down and see if it could bend. Must have been a lot of broken teeth back then. Yeah. Ouch. Wealth will not save Gondor. Uruk do not care for trinkets. Sauron will use gold to buy allies among the Unfortunately, yes. Uh, like as established with the uh, with the Hara dreams. Yeah, he'll um he'll you know he'll he'll bribe them because you know because because he knows he'll just kill them afterwards and then take his take his stuff back. A scream shop, a mumak task. This cub task commemorates the conclusion of an epic hunt. Here we see two dwarves. Uh, um, the first is wielding a mighty axe and striking a deadly blow against a giant mumak. The other, who appears to be his twin, flees from the beast in a panic. The quality of the workmanship indicates that the artist was a master craftsman under the influence of strong ale. So, for mm. being something sculpted while being drunk, it's actually still great quality. Especially for a piece of ivory, basically. There, it's finished. True masterwork. What a fine carving. The front, I etched us killing this here Muma. And the back, our next prize, the mighty Krog. A beast like that is a hunter's legacy. Krog. Show me the carving. <laughs> Isn't it magnificent? Such detail. Look at me striking the mighty beast. Blood everywhere. And why am I etched running away from the Muma in terror? Artistic license, Brother Torvik. If you want to be the hero, I suggest next time you make the card. 
And as we know, the, the hunt for the mighty Graug unfortunately killed the Torvin's brother. You know, it's interesting how many of these artifacts involve Torvin. It's like... It may, almost makes you wonder, was the dude just leaving this stuff scattered around? Shoot. Or we said he dropped it under the influence of strong ale. True, yeah. All the same, though, like, shoot, imagine, you could probably make a museum with the amount of stuff he's dropped while drunk at this rate. A torn banner. Ungol have set upon and partially consumed this crimson banner representing the Dark of Sauron. This is not merely a symbolic act. The oversized children of Shelob are organizing against the Uruks, forming raiding parties to bring down what they consider to be invaders into their lands. Whatever truce may have existed between the factions and now has now ended. We will see also a consequence of that in the next game too. Hmm. Carryovers. Nice. Huh, so Shelob used to be Sauron's pet. We will see just how much again in the next game. So, this game seems to be suggesting that Shelob had a whole mafia of spiders working for her. Well, you have to remember, she's also the descendant of Ungoliant, which was described as a spider, but more as a kind of an eldritch entity. Almost like a Cthulhu-esque monster, you know. Um, but sit, sit, uh, sit in, in the form of a spider. So, she also has the capacity to reproduce very fast. Uh, clever, most clever. This note written on parchment seems to have been written with a previously heretofore undiscovered code. It appears to be neither a skip nor a substitution code. Could it be the note is an answer held? Uh, but basically, yes. And uh, this is also reflected by the fact that the spiders in. Um, uh, Mirkwood, the one that shows up in the Hobbit, are supposed to still also be her progeny, you know, mm. um, which disrupts the ecosystem there. It's interesting, the flies are never a threat to you, nor even a distraction. They're always a good tool against the orcs because of this. Oh, well, that's nice. Sting him in the eyes. Well, the eyes don't sting. Them. Or, or some, or some captains will actually oh. be terrified by those. Uh, so. Wow. <clears throat> I thought said was for a second. Kurunir, if you don't know, is actually the proper history name of Saruman. Well, who knows, Joe? Maybe these flies did stink, but over the years they lost the ability. It's like how evolution took away mankind's ability to swing from trees. And our tails, I suppose. Um, anyway, a star chart, a card from the bone of an unknown animal with many size, this map of the heavens has those now used by Lord Master of some skill. Or if you select individuals, will have been able to use this chart to track the course of the stars in the sky using complex and possibly arcane computations to predict the future. So, probably another history artifact. By that time, we've grown used to seeing them, but the shorter one had grown cold, distant. He could read the leaves, the lines in a man's hand, the bumps on his head. He could see, you know? And I guess it got to him. The knowing. They go off together, and you could tell when they met up with the orcs, the sky would darken, and there would be hail, or rain, or winds that shook the trees. And then, sure enough, everything would clear. They never spoke about any of that, although we'd always want to know. That's not did say. The two were left without saying a word. It's like that guy says in, um... The first pet cemetery with his peak accent. Sometimes as better. Traveling light, maybe. Or maybe I don't know. Maybe you thought he'd have no more use for it. Alright. 
Another mystery. Mordor is full of secrets. The Order of Estari. Messengers sent to contest the will of Sauron. These two went east long ago and were never seen again. Foreboding. Yes, they failed. I guess they failed the test. Probably. Most likely, actually. Oh god, could you imagine? You go there and you find out the test is just like, what is five plus seven? Bad news has wings, the saying goes. So it was with the dispatches from Erebor, heralding the orcs' great defeat at the Battle of the Fire Armies. This particular scroll made its way into Mordor Cave by a messenger whose ill tidings were received less than warmly by his comrades. Though the courier's identity was never revealed, he was referred to by Uruks with great affection as, quote unquote, dinner. Lovely. Oh, you should have seen the guy who turns into a bear. Hmm. Hmm. Hey, right to Shao Nolan. These Uruk live for battle, and we shall not disappoint them. All right. A locked box key. This key was crafted long ago by the locksmith of Casa Doom. It is able to open a wide array of locks. It will be a great value to a burglar or a spy. Because I told you to. More likely, this conversation seems to be between someone who is a blur burglar that can also help uh, you know, a bunch of people escape. That's all I have. Please, my wife. Should have saved more. You should have, you should have saved better than you poor prick. <laughs> yeah, we will see just what happens to this guy later. There are still some paths open out of Mordor. The more we can set Mordor to flame, the more people will reach freedom. Alright. A Frolum's ring. This ring was given to the unhappy bandit Frolum by his beloved wife as a symbol of their undying love. It was violent pulled from Frolum's hand along with his index finger after his capture by the Lark Lord Sauron's minions. Sauron would use this ring to torment Frolum into betraying his comrades. Frolum sounds like Gollum's cousin. Yeah, let's that's left to the imagination. Yeah, let's that's not go there. Is there nothing these Uruk will not desecrate? For them, beauty exists only to be mm. Oh, that's a lovely picture. Would be a shame if someone burnt okay. it. <laughs> a ritual cup. A relic of a free man of Nurn. 
This couple will be used in many rituals, including consecration, ceremonies, and matrimonies. Traditionally, the couple will be filled with bitter waters from the Sea of Nurnen, waters which will be then poured on an item or person as a blessing, or onto the ground to give thanks. With Queen Marvel's mysterious malaise, the cup has been used in increasingly more bizarre and disturbing rites. We don't wanna know. If you drink from the cup, you die. It's like in um, Last Crusade. That was more dependent on what did you chose. Form gateway to worlds unseen. Spirits of Valinor, hear <coughs> prayer and grant great power new to the shores, Queen. Cool story, says some. These tribesmen are desperate. They will do anything to resist the Uruks. I fear Lithariel will never surrender. Her honor will doom them all. <laughs> yeah, surrender. No, okay, all then I'll right. kill all the of them. <laughs> Chasing after some escaped man. A bloodstained buckler. Dwarven made and built to withstand great amounts of punishment, <clears throat> this wooden steel buckler served its user well. Many marks and scorings uh, hid into its usefulness in combat, but the blood stains are perhaps an indication of a grim outcome for the dwarf who carried it into battle. Ah yes, the um, the X mark, normally signifying a wrong answer, it can also mark the wrong answer that will be the end of your life. And, and now we get to hear Thorin finding his brother out of the hunt. <laughs> I don't think he made it. No. I should have been a better hunter. I will avenge you, brother. I will hunt this crowd in your name. I will be the hunter you always wanted me to be. Well, shit. Alas. He lost his brother. Hunter and hunted. Death takes them all. Before closing out, there's one last <coughs> thing, the last piece of Ethyl David that I mentioned Ethyl in to compose the murals. So when you collect all of them, you get this and Celebrimbo recites uh, the poem of Mordor in Elvish. Nani here, Gelar Mordor. Ivab. Gelebren, Yachortha, Ivorn, Fridaiol, Hith, Efuen, An Achared Di, Werienin, Anan, Erio Thelaith Gurth, Edwenno Ogwath, Trilaith Puigadol Dagol, Nathadir Edwagenin, Inaudir Edil, Nunamnin, Natha Togmir Inain, Iwar Dangarnen, Ochedin Valan Nor, Anad Lethad Nor Eduath, An Noded Ramas in Ardon, Michan de Morhir, Natha Lekalad Arfigad, Nin Gostatha Gwaithban Agelatha. Though my power is diminished, it is not wholly spent. We will not abandon Middle-earth and depart into the West until the Betrayer and all his works are undone. Alright, with this we have collected all the optional stuff that was in the area, so next part uh, we, we actually properly have to brand all the war chiefs uh, and then later on finish off uh, the, the Black Hand of Sauron and these remaining servants. So see you for that. See ya.